Tully College. Wait. Now, now, now start. Yeah. Hello, respected principal, Purvas Tully College, Dr. Bihas Chandra Shaha, sir. Keynote speaker, Professor Anita Singh, ma'am. Plenary speakers, Dr. Pinaki De, Mrs. Rezan Sale. IQSC coordinator, Dr. Lipika Ghoshal. The galaxy of intellectuals, assembled dignitaries, faculty members of different institutions, PhD students, my colleagues, dear students, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to one and all in this two-day international e-conference on surpassing boundaries to create critique identities, a praxis of female. We are overwhelmed, overjoyed to receive more than 850 participants, to be precise, 878 participants in this event. In the very beginning of the program, let us sink into the depth of music. We welcome Mrs. Pratusha Ghosh, faculty member of the Sanskrit department, Purvastali College, to make a formal inauguration with a song. Ah, ah, ah. 
Hello. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. We were transported to a state of bliss through your mellifluous voice, listening to your Sanskrit rendition of Tagore's Bengali song. Presently, we are facing a tremendous crisis. Our normal lives have been terribly devastated by the outbreak of the pandemic. However, just as Tagore is talking about transgressing the levels of Murto and Raga to embrace the state of Saraswat, to be in harmony with the environment, it is our small endeavor to go beyond our confined spaces, leaving behind our trivial miseries to embrace the world and connect with the global audience. Now I would like to call upon our respected principal, a gem of a scholar and the navigator of the center of learning, Dr. Bivas Chandra Shaha, sir, to welcome the guests. Thank you so much. Uh, Namaskar. Myself, Dr. Bivas Chandra Shaha, principal of Purvastari College, the host college of this conference. Hope all of you are well. Ladies and gentlemen, in this conference, we have with us Professor Anita Singh, Department of English, Bangladesh Hindu University, Baranasi, India. Ma'am, welcome to this e conference. Shushagatam. Thank you, ma'am, for giving your kind consent to deliver keynote address in this e conference. We are sure that your expertise in this field would be an excellent contribution to this program. We are delighted and honored to have you as the guest and listen to your deliberation in this e-conference. I am certain that we will be very much enriched by your lecture. Once again, on behalf of Pamela Purvastari College, I welcome you to this e-conference. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Rejan Sale, Center of Ibsen Studies, University of Oslo, Norway, to this e-conference. Shushagatam, ma'am. It is really a proud moment for Purvastari College to have you here as a speaker with us today. I am sure that all of us would be immensely benefited from your lecture, for which we are all very eager. Once again, behalf of the Purvastari College family, I welcome you in this e-conference. Friends, we have with us Dr. Pinaki De, Department of English, Raja Perimon College, West Bengal, India. Sir, you are most welcome to this e conference. Shushagatam. 
I feel proud to have you as a speaker. Thank you, sir, for giving your kind consent to deliver a plenary lecture. I am sure that we will enjoy, we will enjoy your lecture during this e-conference session. Two more. On behalf of family of Purvastri College, I am welcoming you in this e-conference. Ladies and gentlemen, we have two technical sessions for paper presentation. I must heartily welcome the speakers, Dr. Shagata Rai, Gitanjali College of Engineering and Technology, Hyderabad, India, Mr. Devashish Mitra, Government Engineering College, Daman, Dada, and Nagar Haveli, and Daman and Dew, Dr. Patra Sarati Mandal, Manhum, Mahavidula, Purulia, Mrs. Yasmina, Ms. Yasmina Melikova, Institute of Philosophy, National Academy of Sciences, Azerbaijan, Mr. Othonu Kumar Pal, JMS College, Munger, Bihar, India, Ms. Srijita Rai, Kultoli, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar College, West Bengal, India. I am thankful to them for their response in this short period of time. All of you are most welcome. I must, I must welcome all the viewers, the, the participants, the students, academicians all over the globe who are watching this e-conference. Without you, organizing this kind of event would be part time. On behalf of Family of Purvastri College, I am welcoming all of you in this e-conference. Thank you all and enjoy this e-conference. So, Thank you so much, sir. As the convener of the event, I take the honor and privilege to once again welcome all the dignitaries, guests, and participants in this e-conference. Women in literature are mostly constructed as sexualized objects in the dominant patriarchal discourse. The category of women is a fictional construction developed and naturalized over the ages through the writing of the male authors. Literature down the ages is biased and sexist, which represented women as the other to men. And this othering made the representation of women possible by personifying desire that the male have, and consequently, it made the actual women absent within the dominant culture. Judith Butler opines that gender identity is, I quote, performative accomplishment compelled by social sanction and taboo, unquote. Thus, I quote again, woman itself is a term in process, a beginning, a constructing that cannot be said to originate or to end, unquote. Thus, it is an ongoing process and a site for contest. Upon analysis of canonical literature, it can be found that portrayals of women were limited to certain roles, either as submissive, chaste, silent, self-sacrificing, or as seductress, vamp, or horse. Broadly speaking, women fit into the category of either a desexualized goddess or an over-sexualized whore. These Stereotypical representations of women and the constructed identities have many implications. Firstly, the absence of women gives the idea that men are culturally superior than women and they are the norm. Secondly, it naturalizes the gender identities created by the society. Thirdly, it legitimizes violence against women. Fourthly, it divides the space by suggesting that women belong to home as opposed to men who belong to the world. This stereotyping is everywhere. We can talk about novels like Fifty Shades trilogy or films like Pretty Woman, where a prostitute is saved by a man and later she becomes a good woman. Or in rap videos where African-American men are seen dominating women in children's literature through stories of damsel in distress or sleeping beauty who depend upon the prince charming for their rescue or in commercials 
advertisements or item numbers in movies where scantily clad women are shown dancing provocatively if we examine the theatrical space we get an even more uneasy picture theater was a sp space exclusively reserved for the male it was written produced and performed by male from its inception male performers suggested female roles by mimicking stylized hand and body movements and gestures these showcased the excesses of the opposite gender by contrasting what men behave or do female impersonators were desired even more than the actresses for projecting greater feminine charm thus it forced the real women to conform to the ideals set by the impersonators through what cu ellen case calls a quote masks of patriarchal production unquote it is very recently and sometimes intermittently that these stereotypes were challenged and the boundaries meant for containing were surpassed but it was not always received cordially now while the influx of feminist theories has given impetus to redress the stereotypical representations of women it has also been accused of essentialism and homogenization by obscuring other variables of class caste race or sexual orientation that in turn push the women of color asian women lesbian queer trans women to the more peripheral space we hope to address some of these issues in this two day international e conference we request the, all the participants to kindly use the chat box for asking your questions or queries and not for posting any greetings or good evening good afternoon messages so that we can segregate the questions it is with heavy heart that i would like to announce that due to some unavoidable circumstances one of our esteemed speakers professor rose sacfio could not join us we all are aware of the difficult times that befell us and we pray for her well being now to continue the program we are very fortunate to have with us professor anita singh who is a guardian figure to me and who has consented immediately when i mentioned her about the event now professor anita singh is a professor in the department of english and coordinator of the center for women studies and development at bhu baranasi india presently she is a fellow at the indian institute of advanced study iias shimla she received fulbright nehru visiting lecturer fellowship for the year 1314 2013-14 at the university of virginia usa her two recent edited books are gender space and resistance women and theater in india and revisiting literary theory and criticism indian and western perspectives she has completed a major research project sanctioned by the icssr on staging gender performing women in ramlila of ramnagar in september 2016 she has also published interviews with indian women theater artists in asian theater journal that is published from university of hawaii press she has contributed four chapters in the routledge handbook of asian theater she was the guest editor for the special issue of the journal gender issues published by springer in 2018 she was the conference chair for the future of women conference held in malaysia 2018 and in colombo sri lanka 2019 her forthcoming book is titled staging feminism colon gender violence and performance in contemporary india that will be published by rothlich today she will be talking about performance art as a site of gender resistance and faith so please ladies and gentlemen join me in welcoming professor anita singh the platform is yours ma'am Thank you so much, Dr. Samya. So I'll share my screen first.
so. Yeah, my screen is visible now. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So yes. at the outset, uh, I would extend my greetings to the principal, Dr. Bebas Chandra Shah of the Purbas Tali College, and lots of good wishes to Dr. Soumya Ghosh for organizing this conference and for inviting me here. So at the outset, I would begin. You can see the title that is there on the screen. Swamya has given a very wonderful introduction, so I need not add much to that. Feminist theorists, women's movement thinkers and scholars have long established that categories of sex, gender and sexuality, which appear to be seemingly natural and coherent, are culturally constructed through repeated stylization of bodily acts, as Butler puts it. Bodies are regulated, disciplined into being. The female body is mostly widely discriminated with codes of propriety, imperatives of bodily purity and chastity, and the cult of domesticity are routinely heaped on this female body. Uh, with these preliminary remarks, this presentation would look at the genre of performance art, the challenges, codes of gender and sexuality that resides and circulates in most societies. I will begin with outlining the elements of this genre, the context, the practices, and some practitioners of this performance art. So this study basically is premised on the idea that no aspect of life, including art, is exempt from politics, and that art involves a conscious intention to restructure conditions of gender exclusion, stereotypes, misogyny in our culture. There is an inherent stumble block in arriving at a definitional understanding of performance art due to the intermingling of various elements in this form. Rose Lee Goldberg in performance art from futurism to the present recognizes that constructivism, futurism, Dadaism, surrealism as inspirations to this form. So it refers to an unconventional form of art having a political bent presented live to an audience. A very bare definition, if we can start with. It became popular in the mid-1960s into the 1970s. It arose particularly from the visual art environment and concurrently sacked the theatrical representational conventions. From its anti-art beginning, Performance art has allowed artists to experiment with personal and audience boundaries, question authority, make powerful statements. Performance art is art in which artist is present when the art is being made, says the Canadian performer Joanna Householder in a video. On the other hand, unlike the narrative structures of drama and theatre, the unpredictability of performance largely lies in its aversion to scripts, rehearsals. Improvisation and participation emerge as pivotal elements leading a performance work. To use Marina Abramovic's definition of performance, she says, it is mental and physical construction that the performer makes in specific time and space with the audience. Both the audience and the performer make the piece together. Further, she gives an example to show the difference between the two, that is the theatre and the performance art. In a theatre, a knife is not a knife and blood is ketchup. In a performance, a knife is a knife and blood is real. Whereas a theatre can be rehearsed, a performance cannot be rehearsed. Performance Art was a reaction to the prevailing representation paradigm of visual and performative art, that is the theater. So it got a lot of impetus with Antonin Arthur's Theater of Cruelty. And we know uh, in his work, Theater and It Double, he says, we cannot go on prostituting the idea of theater. And he says, he, and he wished to destroy all forms of language 
and create a unique language that was somewhere in the middle between gesture and thought. And he further attempted to attack, he attacked all masterpieces as being irrelevant, even Shakespeare and Ibsen and others, he thought that they were irrelevant. And he coined this idea of a total theater. And he says, this theater should be something that disturbs us like plague and that creates a sensuous unrest, raw emotions, that it awakens us through its raw emotions through theater. So, uh, and uh, so with this, uh, you know, the, then there were others also that were adding on to the idea of this kind of an anti-art. You can see on the right hand side of my screen, happenings by Alain Kaparov, George Mekinos, uh, you know, Fluxus. So they both were against the idea of a kind of a program theater. They challenged orthodox art forms and cultural norms. And they brought in an interdisciplinarity in the, uh, the, the forms that they were creating, whether they called it events and uh, they wanted to have something between shared between the audience and the uh, and the part of the, and the and the presenters, so to say. So either they would paint a picture, squeeze a lemon, sweep the floor, climb a ladder, shout a political slogan, or sit on a chair. So these events were organized, and they were not rehearsed. And participant did not know what is going to happen. Instructions were given to the participants when they arrived on this particular site, and so on. So, borrowing from uh, theater, dance, visual arts, painting, sculpture, poetry, this is how this performance art grew. It And a performance art piece is more of a process than a finished product. In it, artists engage in a singular or multiple actions for a specific duration in a specific site. The site could be any space, art museums, cafes, streets, etc. The effort moved from the evaluations of one-dimensional static representational voyeuristic work of art to an appreciation of interactive presentational participatory based on happenings, event, collective art, and embodied event, thereby creating a distinctive aesthetics of the performative. Erika Fischer-Lisch, in her book, The Transformative Part of Performance, uses four points to describe the new aesthetics of transformative, performative terms. She says, performance comes into being by the bodily co-presence of actors and spectators, by the encounter and interaction. Further, she says, what happens in a performance is transitory and ephemeral. Thirdly, performance does not transmit any pre-given meanings. And lastly, Performances are characterized by the eventness, the specific mode of an experience they allow for, its, for a particular form of liminal experience. Performances are not passive events happening on stage. They attain, attain meaning by the co-presence and transactions between actors and performance. Performance art then seeks to effectively transform the dynamics between the artist and the audience from passive viewers in an art gallery or spectators in a theater show, the audience becomes active participants or collaborators in most performance artwork. The works are usually engaging, interactive, often meant to disturb people to come out of their comfort zones to think, act, explore their own mind. Now, when we look at Women performance artists. Performance art fosters a mode of presentation free of encumbrances via media offers. Artists the advantage of escaping the limitations of behavioral codes, exploring the politics of identity. For women practitioners, this implies the possibilities of an expression unfiltered through the constricting discourses like patriarchy. It offers them the freedom of an experiential rather than a precedented art. The 1960s and 70s were a time of social upheavals in United States and Europe. And even in India, it was around 1974 when we had the Toward Equality Report. 
and uh, was made public and this established this toward equality report established the foundation of women's movement in a very large way so and so we see this was a time when the fight for equality for women with regard to sexuality reproductive rights the family and the workplace were uh, you know very active so this genre was to take hold the actions of artists and artists performs as central to the work of art forte writes in her analysis of feminist performance art in the 1960s and 70s within this movement women's performance emerges as a specific strategy that allies postmodernism and feminism women used performance as a deconstructive strategy to demonstrate the objectification of women and its result artists effectively use their bodies and actions to produce artwork in the first instance body art was performed live in front of an audience frequently though it was memorialized in photographs and that in themselves became stand in for the events in contrast work by women artists often asserted that the female body was active as opposed to a passive entity in line with the feminist politics now the first artwork that i would bring in as an example is the american artist caroli shechman known for her multimedia works on body narrative sexuality and gender so in one of her piece which is termed called the interior skull performed in 1975 she stands naked before the audience and she takes out a book and reads a piece which is actually a litany of the misogynist reactions a female encounters in her career and then she takes she unravels a scroll from her vagina from it she reads a satirical account of a meeting with a film maker who had criticized her work for being excessively subjective so on my right hand side of screen you can see a small uh, you know photo of this performance another strategy that was commonly used by feminist performance artists was removing of the mask which was utilized to demonstrate the consequence of female representation in media on the psyche of women mackeny writes the masquerade or masking occurs when women play with their assigned gender roles in multiple often contradictory ways adopting adapting overlaying and subverting the hegemonic discourse in the process the rise in the use of performance art came at an era of calls for women liberation by utilizing the medium artists were able to question the subject object relationship inherent in many male produced artworks the female performance artist could also subvert the assumption of the perceived artistic masculine mastery of high art by emphasizing her own production and agency women artists utilized performance as a medium as it enabled and reflected self ownership of body many artists explored gender through representation of the body and by using their own bodies in the creative process i will now move on to discuss practitioners who have taken on to this genre of the performance art the first person that i take up is marina abramovic she is a serbian american performance artist abramovic was born in belgrade in 1946 her parents fought alongside the future president of uh, the president of yugoslavia uh, during the world war second world war abramovic recalls that my mother was a major in the army a national hero and she created complete military discipline in the house and she says i even had to sleep perfectly if my bed was messy my mother would wake me up in the middle of the night and say why are you sleeping so messily she says when she was 29 and she ran ran away from her house my mother actually went to the police and when the policeman found out my age he said we have better things to do so by doing this she says how regimented and disciplined a life and existence she led her work explores body art endurance art and feminist art the relationship between performer and art audience 
the limits of a body and the possibilities of the mind being active for over four decades abramovic is referred to as the grandmother of performance art she set out to explore the physical and mental limitations of the body now two of our presentation i will briefly discuss the first again to the right hand side uh, you can see the artist is present in this piece abramovic sat in a rectangular drawn with tape in the floor of the second floor atrium of the museum of modern art theater light shone on her sitting in a chair and in a chair opposite her visitors would come and sit so in that picture you can see a visitor sitting next to her and there are so many waiting to sit next to her every day during the opening hours for the entire 10 weeks run of the exhibition abramovic sat as silent and still as a statue in a spot lit chair in a in its museum atrium that we see as weeks wore on visitors began queuing many broke down in tears when they finally found themselves before her so there was no beginning there was no end there was no crescendo but the direct and immaterial performance art had the effect had a very strong effect that made people who were sitting next to her you know break down with emotions and uh, the next piece on the left you can see it's it is called the lips of thomas performed in 1975 which she devised and performed in a gallery in austria as a solo work featuring acts of consumption and self inflicted violence while allow, allowing the responses to the event might be informed by tradition of ritual and popular spectacle in the performance this uh, lips of thomas marina abramovic undertakes a range of actions that push her physical limits to an extreme and finally results in the transgression of bodily boundaries she starts off with eating 1 kilo of honey followed by the consumption of 1 liter of red wine then she breaks the red wine glass with a hand the action becomes more violent and masochistic including in an image of cutting the five pointed star into her stomach with a razor blade which you can see stark naked and sometimes she did not even perform she wore clothes also like the the image that you can see she ate uh, then she uh, you know then she lay on she whipped herself after cutting the star the pentagon on her you know stomach she uh, she whipped herself and lay down on a cross made of ice for an hour almost bleeding copiously and very often during this performance audience would not be able to bear this and they would come from the audience space and to lift her up because the pain that she was undergoing had become very unbearable for the audience she says endurance and empathy is the function of an artist i am not a therapist i am not a spiritual leader these elements are in the art it is therapeutic spiritual social political everything it has many layers but art has to have many layers if it does not then forget it now the next uh, presentation next uh, performance that i would take up is as you can see she is a young girl and a student at columbia university so this is a case of uh, campus rape and how does she react to this campus rape you know she protests and she creates a performance art piece out of uh, the harrowing experiences that she has so this is called the performance art piece that she evolves is called the mattress performance or carry that weight in 2014 15 uh, skolniv was it, it was a work of endurance art which emma sukovis conducted in as a thesis in the final year of a visual arts degree at columbia university Emma was raped on the first day as a sophomore year in a college. She began her senior thesis with this, uh, you know, performance, which she termed as "Carry the Weight," a work of art that brings her privacy to the public. 
the columbia university attempted to silence the kate when she went on and complained about the this incident she created a list of procedures which she called rules of engagement written on the walls of a studio in the university's watson hall and you can see rules of engagement so the rules of engagement or what is the material of performance what is the description how should the the performance be carried on so the rules of engagement said that she would carry the mattress off the campus and if she had to she had to leave the campus mattress in a safe place when she left the campus for 9 months she carried the mattress throughout wherever she went on the campus till her graduation ceremony and you can see the small picture on the gray that is her graduation ceremony ceremony it sparked an important conversation about consent on campus it was also about what happens to victims of sexual assault sexual revolution on campus here in this event mattress becomes symbolic of the assault a site of violation and a symbol of a movement that was initiated by emma skolnovis so with this i move to two more performances from the indian context So Malika Taneja is a Delhi-based theatre artist. Her play "Thoda Dhyan Se" can be best described as an experimental satire. It is a passionate monologue and caricature of the society and issues we deal with every day. She has interactions with the audience during and after her performance. The play is reactionary to the Shakti Mill gang rape case and even the Nirbhaya case, so to say. of the the shakti mill was a photojournalist who was raped in mumbai she is a member of the theater collective the tadpole repertory and also the founder and curator of the cultural festival lost and found this particular piece was developed in an assignment in 2013 at the tadpole repertory in new delhi the performance was provoked by her anger using her own body as a protest against gender inequality sexual harassment and assault and critiques the injunctions given to women as cares and confines by the patriarchal society one of the promos of this performance uh, held in mumbai says that this performance is a quick guide to how a woman should be in order to be safe the content of the performance keeps evolving as a solo act so the performance has two act the first part is silent gaze so the performer stands sometimes uh, at some places she performs nude at some places she she wears uh, lingerie or whatever in the beginning so it starts off with nothing and then it proceeds to uh, keeping on clothes so the first part is silent gaze standing nude on the stage for full 5 minutes she stands on stage either nude or in a lingerie breaking the traditional fourth wall addressing the audience directly and challenges the community in no uncertain term in a performance she satirizes the sanction prescribed to women on how to avert the male gaze and prevent rape and sexual violence by adjusting and changing the way they dress this comprises of the gaze of the audience and her returned gaze the discomfort of seeing a nude body each audience members she records react differently the second part after 5 minutes is the second part so to say is donning clothes one on top of the other while talking erratically about all the things women need to be careful about how you talk how you walk how you attract the wrong people thoda dhyan se rehna chahiye aapko pata hai na zamana kharab hai जब आपको पता है कि जमाना खराब है तो थोड़ा ध्यान से बस सो यू हैव टू बी अ लिटिल केयरफुल यू नो द वर्ल्ड इज अ बैड प्लेस राइट व्हेन यू नो द वर्ल्ड इज अ बैड प्लेस देन जस्ट बी अ लिटिल केयरफुल दैट्स ऑल शी कीप्स वेयरिंग क्लोथ्स हैप हैज एडली मटरिंग ड्रेस फॉर प्रॉपरली पाइलिंग लेयर्स ऑफ क्लोथ्स ऑन हर सेल्फ टिल इट इज इम्पॉसिबल टू वेयर एनी मोर क्लोथ्स एंड शी कीप्स आस्किंग मैं कैसी लग रही हूँ the play looks at the absurdity behind the directions given to women by advice by a paternalistic society her words her body stands for the abuse of equality justice and freedom of all people 
targeting those who link women's clothes to the abuse her caution and cautions her cautions challenges notions of safety attacks victim blaming in molestation rape cases and challenges the notion of safety that if a woman dresses in a certain way thus she will not be raped now with this i move to the second uh, performance and uh, this is as you can see by shweta bhatar shweta bhatar is nagpur based she has a masters in sculpture from ms university baroda and she is known for taking up themes related to gender and abuse a performance artwork series titled faith was staged at an inconceivable venues ranging from garbage dumps and iron mines to construction sites and in the air hoardings her interests are, are public project performance land art and organic farming women and food are her main concern she has a gram art project and she has worked in i have a dream project and this was an international artist residency residency project on global farming she is an artist with a cause nirbhaya gangrep inspired her to make a chastity belt with a video fitted in it which showcased the brutality of molestation she made a chastity belt like a contraption that was fixed and which showed the brutality of molestation rape abuse so it is on the other slide i'll quickly move back so you can see she is lying on the floor she has a chastity belt and this chastity belt is in the in the middle and which has a video so the audience you can see below the audience have to peer in that video to see the scenes of rape enacted and these scenes are mostly from bollywood they are uh, bollywood rape scenes that are collected and this whole thing is very horrifying so she says you had to peep into the hole made in the belt to watch the dramatized video of assaults horrible scenes she and she has performed this piece it uh, at latitude 28 art gallery jnu ahmedabad and many places even in streets you can see the particular performance photo that i have is a street performance she has a series of performance which i said she is titled as faith performance so i'll take up four of her faith performance the first faith performance was she took up to highlight the miserable existence of sex workers human trafficking and forced prostitution she hung from a harness 400 feet above the ground near a red light area in nagpur and wrote words vishwas for 6 hours on a billboard she climbed up this you know harness and for 6 hours she kept writing vishwas the next uh, performance piece that she did was it was a very moving performance when she sat inside a huge transparent plastic bag writing the words faith and vishwas on the walls of the bag near a slum in nagpur in protest against the newborn girls who were being wrapped in plastic bags and thrown into the garbage heap you can see the images so she is inside this plastic bag and she is continuously writing faith till the entire plastic bag is covered with the word faith and vishwas reflecting on her work on female feticide she says i this did i did this performance for each girl child who is murdered dumped in landfill drains garbage there is faith that one day people will change their perception of women and this world will become a better place for women to live freely with respect individuality and equality that the human being deserves the third performance that i i could not get the picture but uh, uh, so the third faith performance that i bring before you is she performed this in a village in rajasthan she was told that in this particular village in jaipur the girls dropout rate was very high so she met 40 such girls who had dropped out and asked them about their dreams and wrote their dreams down on a paper and stuck on 40 pairs of feet made of cow dung and then in a gathering she invited all the parents of these 40 girls and even the other villagers and she titled this piece as jaipur ke 
चालीस सपने जयपुर स्पॉटी ड्रीम्स एंड वेन द विलेजर्स एंड द पेरेंट्स यू नो हर्ड द ड्रीम्स ऑफ द गर्ल्स ऑफ द विलेजेस इट वॉज सच अ मूविंग थिंग एंड शी सेज दैट दिस इंस्पायर्ड पीपल टू सेंड द गर्ल्स प्रोबेबली टू स्कूल और मे बी इंस्पायर्ड सर्टन काइंड ऑफ चेंज दैट शी वॉन्टेड टू एफेक्ट द फोर्थ पीस दैट हियर आई वुड बी स्पीकिंग अबाउट इज दिस वॉज फॉर द स्टूडेंट्स एट कोटा कोचिंग सेंटर battling stress and loneliness she made a 40 feet scroll made from the notes given by the coaching centers so she she took the notes from the students and she wrote vishwas for 6 hours she went uh, high up on uh, uh, you know on on a on a pedestal and then she kept writing you can see on that image there so and then a certain ngo said that reported that after her performance they received more calls for help after she had performed this on one side you can even see the parched uh, land where she has planted uh, the birds faith this was uh, done to uh, for the farmers suicide for the suicide that the farmers were committing and then she she also you know she wrote to the prime minister saying uh, you know prime minister we must also grow in india and so on so so the need to take care of the farmers is what she emphasized in her performance so these performances can hardly be viewed in a distant manner they challenge the audience to respond physically by arousal of something that is akin to anguish agony anxiety and awkwardness the spectators are drawn entirely into the performance performers intimate sphere into pure physiological actuality in a nichian dinosian primal experience the performance stages the body as materiality again as fischerlich uses the term phenomenal being the live nature of art imparts imparts it a uniqueness and irreproducibility thus making it ephemeral and tangible intangible these performances are more bodily centered and presentational narration rather than representational and logocentric they poke and disturb conventional power structures and transform the dynamics between the audience and the artist the audiences are pushed out of their comfort zone and they are unable to think act and reflect the critiques of the social subjects present in these world work the reduction of the female subject to docile body seems problematic and they are remis- reminiscent of foucault's analysis of biopolitics the exclusion and abandonment of people whose lives are considered valueless the treatment of the relationship between power body and sexuality all draw attention to a, a perspective of a feminist politics that aims to promote women's autonomy thank you Uh, thank you so much ma'am for your brilliant talk theater is a very contentious space where the once excluded women took hold of the powerful medium and sought to redress the age old neglect stereotyping gender bias and sexism your presentation makes us aware of how the proliferation of women's voices have broken the barriers i can see the chat box is flooded with questions queries and statements in praise of your mesmerizing talk we may not be able to take up all the questions but we will try to select some representative ones and it was such an engaging session that it provoked our audience to think as well and in this respect i would like to mention a comment it's by seema sharma she says in my opinion instead of asking girls to wear proper dress boys should be asked to treat women properly exactly. very rightly said ma'am very true. Very true. so the first question we got it's by surekha chattopadhyay she says ma'am what's the difference between gesture and posture in theater and performance what's the difference between gesture and posture 
in theater and performance gesture could be uh, you know any slight movement you may not change your posture but the difference between them is very slight uh, you they could they, they are very often used interchangeably but gesture could be a slight wink of the eye a raising of the eyebrow uh, you know but then again that and posture is more of a of the movement in space the movement in space okay so the way you position your body and gesture could be any slight uh, one would say movement of your body that indicates or that is that conveys an idea postures also convey an idea gestures also convey an idea they can convey an idea that they can convey a meaning they 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 carry meaning in theater they carry meaning gestures and postures both carry meaning both could be loaded with meaning you know so there are different forms of expression or different forms of communicating with the audience uh, thank you ma'am next question by megha singh she says indeed a very captivating presentation ma'am what is your opinion about performing arts in india and its future in the post covid conditions a performance think... art course has a lot of future but wouldn't know how uh, post covid scenario of course life would go on and uh, maybe issues that these performance artists would take up would be different or uh, or enlarged rather i wouldn't say different they would be more the canvas would be more expansive and uh, of course whatever is a serious concern to an artist is what the artist takes up an artist is very a, very passionately involved in the subject that the artist is dealing with so post covid of course the issues that continue to engage us would be issues that uh, that would engage an artist you know art never dies art always uh, you know finds a way and art always expresses our experiences and our concerns so whatever our concerns arise uh, art would uh, address that art always has a way and a capacity to to encompass or to embrace experiences in varied ways and that is why you see art keeps on changing i mean art is never stagnant it keeps on evolving and experimenting and innovating because uh, with these innovations you you are able to capture more of your experiences the nuances of your experiences you know so it is always trying to make a little more effort to do something else thank you ma'am uh, then it's by kundan thakur uh, he asks how women effectively portray images of violence horror during the country's partition i mean through their plays performances okay so how do they effectively yeah several play uh, several performances one play that comes to my mind is b gauri's or kitne to play probably uh, some yes ma'am yeah, yeah. yeah. yes ma'am powerful powerful performance of partition that is why i said art we need not worry about art we need not worry about creativity creativity finds its way creativity fills up the space you know creativity so or kitne tukde by b gauri is a very powerful play that uh, you know you have five women on stage and it is actually borrowed from the other side of silence by urvashi butalia yes. and how how graphically the the violence of the partition and every aspect of the violence of the partition is very beautifully portrayed in that so as i said every violent incident whether it was nirbhaya you had series of plays that were written uh, somya has written uh, on ham muktara mm -hmm. and there's so many uh, i would say plays that came out of nirbhaya gangre you know maya krishna rao's and this particular play that i was talking about thoda dhyan se was also inspired yes. by the kind of you know after this nirbhaya rape happened people said why was she traveling so late at night hmm. 9 o'clock is not the right time what was she wearing was her dress provocative despite all that we still go back to these stereotypical you know hackneyed questions about questioning women's responsibility victim blaming and so on so uh, kundan of course you know partition had its own slew of you know people who represented partition in so many different ways in so many creative ways and theater of course and if you want if you are interested in uh, you know seeing how theater represented you must see big bodies or kitne tukde surely 
ma'am in this respect i also have a question yes uh, like ma'am in the past 2 uh, 3 decades we have yeah. seen a proliferation of women's plays yes. and we have seen how women portray images of violence sexual violence on stage so from that ma'am is there any distinct feminist dramaturgy that has evolved over the years or and if yes then how this dramaturgy is different from the traditional plays performed by the males in case of ma'am representing sexual violence on stage actually this has always been a very contentious issue with feminist theorization elan shorter says the wilderness you know feminist theory in wilderness <laughs> so it is still in wilderness and feminist theorist or feminist performers so to say they've always always borrowed from the the forms that are available so it is it is very improvisatory i wouldn't say that there is a hard and fast or a fixed dramaturgy the moment you fix something it stagnates so it's very fluid the form is very fluid and very exper exper experimental and experiential i would say so the stage and the form is very experimental and very experiential and you cannot really categorize uh, ways in which a feminist dramaturgy uh, can be established as a feminist dramaturgy there are no ways to establish you see each one is experiencing and uh, and experimenting in very different ways so stage is a space you know any like peter book say take any space and uh, yeah. and you have audience and you can create that so so that is what they start off with the bodies are you know they don't and, and one thing that they use very minimal spaces not not that again not necessarily they they can even use very cluttered spaces cluttered yeah. spaces also represent something the cluttering of their lives so space is a very symbolic stage and they use it in a very Uh, symbolistic way so th there is no one dramaturgy that women use basically uh, it is a strategy they have multiple uh, strategies they they resort to multiple strategies in order to uh, deconstruct or denaturalize uh, some denormalize things that are uh, accepted and taken for granted okay thank you next one we have from dr tanima kumari uh, i think you know her ma'am uh, she yeah she asked uh, why scars are important in the performances art of marina abramovich scars cuts yes ma'am scars yes ma'am scars scars okay scar scar marks scar marks okay no there are no scar marks she actually uh, bodily you know harms herself so basically she says endurance and empathy two words that she uh she kind of boils her art to and what she does even even when i when i first uh, you know saw her uh, art like for me like i couldn't understand why is she doing that so uh, she uses scars or scars be, uh, because one she comes from a very authoritarian background very disciplinary background and uh, and she says that uh, you know uh, so another purpose is to push the bodily limits and the mental limits how much you can push your bodily limits and your mental the boundaries of your body your material materiality of your body and the and your mind so this is one purpose and she says an empathy she says so when she performs she want, wants a transformation in the person who is witnessing it so like there was a very weird i mean it sounds very weird she uh, had another performer and uh, uh, they they performed a piece i'm forgetting what exactly was it called and they both were standing on a narrow doorway both were absolutely nude standing on a narrow doorway and the audience were to pass from the narrow doorway i'm forgetting what it was titled actually probably it was not even titled and so when you pass from the narrow doorway you had to brush uh, between these two bodies and so so she says this experiencing bodies you know experiencing pain experiencing agony experiencing mind so this artist is present is a piece where she sits on a chair and she only looks directly at the audience so so we don't have time to look at each other look in the eye for so long and she says that the people and huge big artist and hollywood stars would come and sit next to her and so she says there was a kind of a transformation that happened she too could not explain 
that she could she too could not explain that maybe they read her pain and she would read the pain in the eyes of the people who were sitting next to her so scar probably has a function of uh, has a transformative or a curative function or a function of an empathic uh, understanding between our empathic uh, you know relationship between the audience and the spectator so this empathy the theater per se uh, you know does not allow because you are sitting in a darkened auditorium and what is there is uh, on the display so there is this third wall and so on so this she breaks down and she reaches out to the audience and looks in the eye and she tries to understand their pain and take their pain and share her pain as well it's uh, yeah okay ma'am thank you next by abhishek vattacharya he says art is integrally associated with society politics and culture it may have a therapeutic use but it is also transcendental how are you are we to or to recognize the transcendental aspects of performance arts how are we to recognize the transcendental aspects of performance arts uh, the transcendental i mean in in the in the art pieces that we were talking about so they are particular temporal special and as well as you know transcendental they they, they make you trans transcend the issues that uh, that directly or temporally affect you so in that sense art is transcendental art art is not simply local temporal limited to local and the temporal sphere it has the capacity to transcend these local and temporal uh, you know concerns okay okay ma'am thank you then we have bashob datta ghosh uh, she says very enlightening presentation ma'am how far do you think these performances uh, create an impact on the condition of women who are actually suffering in india how far do you think these performances create an impact on the condition of women i mean if you are trying to say that does it have a, a direct link to somebody who is suffering may it may not have but it does have because it it is creating a climate of dissent it is creating a climate of uh, of that such things are not all it is creating a debate it's creating a dialogue so art has that capacity to create a dialogue to create an idea so and that is also important it may not be very activist in that sense of the term it it may not be uh, you know legally effective it is not you know issuing a uh, a kind of a verdict or anything as uh, it may not have an immediate so to say an immediate response but it does percolate down to the minds and ideas of people you know so these they, they are these ideas are circulated so for instance a, a play like thoda dhyan se of course it does nothing immediately it will not do anything immediately but it does create and generate a kind of an uh, an idea so all the people who have been to her play they come out of the play with a certain idea with a certain debate in their mind ki are wearing clothes uh, you know or women safety decides in the clothes that she wears so it creates a dialogue it creates a dialogue that is what i would suggest so say thank you so much ma'am then we have mini rao uh, she asks how women use performance to vent out their angst and atrocity done to them can we say they use it as a medium to shepherd their predicament um women use performance to vent out the angst and atrocity done to them yes very true not necessarily these are the the atrocity done to them but to people at large and that can also create an angst in you uh, of a similar kind if you are experiencing it so you are empathetic in the experience of uh, you know these atrocities that are committed around you you almost experience it first hand you almost experience it and you react to, to it in a performance piece so like like our reactions are all uh, you know spread out in different areas like if you are a, if you are an activist you will react to it in a different way if i am an academician i will bring out the change the way i have a platform uh, to do if i am a politician i will try to do it in a different way 
you know so we bring out our angst to the atrocities that we see around us if we are well meaning in the ways and means that are uh, available to us that are available to us you know so like if you are a teacher mini you can go to your classroom and talk about these inequalities and inequities and uh, and all that to your students so you are doing your bit you are doing your bit isn't it so or you know you have children or you have you know family so when you talk about all this so you are doing your bit you are being political and you are uh, you know shepherding your uh, you know in a way your inputs to a certain ide uh, idea and ideology thank you ma'am next priyam francis uh, she says very powerful art but did the parents continue to support their girls's dreams uh, so again yeah in that village in the jaipur village yeah of course so she says like once this performance was done done and uh, over with it so the so then she invited all the parents and the people of the villages of course they were moved so maybe not all would have been transformed at least if one person one person one family in the village was transformed the mission of the performance uh, i guess uh, is achieved even if one person was performed maybe this one person would be infectious and would create change in another person in time to come so of course people people like it they moved and they cried so she she registers her response she says the response to her performance was that the parents cried when she read out the dreams of the girls and the villagers were all moved so of course if they are moved not necessarily they'll transform overnight but it does lead to a change surely then we have ranjana merotra uh, she says do these performance uh, really impact society and can they be a vehicle of change towards women and in this connection she also says do these performances really impact um, yeah. i think the same question yeah, the same thing same yeah yes ranjana i mean uh, you know anything as i said it percolate it trickles down you know this relationship the gender relationship the our belief systems are so so strongly entrenched that superstructure they take a little time to change you know you can't have a change of your mindset overnight you can't have a change of uh, what you have believed or what you have been taught uh, for for a very long time so it does take time but these discussions and discourses must carry on because these discussions and discourses over a period of time they do affect you so in that sense of the term one could say that the performances are vehicles of change maybe not immediate they are not magic bullets that would change you overnight but yes they do have the potential to to affect change they do have a potential to affect change even if it is gradual or uh, it takes time if, if, if anything that you know has to happen will happen will take a little time to change and art also has that kind of a function and that is why you see art pieces are banned why because they do affect society they do have an impact on society surely ma'am and we have the last question it's yes. by toli achumi uh, the question is protesting through intricate art though powerful to the educated people i doubt the message will be equally understood by the common people what is your view ma'am so these performance art as i said they you should they, that depends on who is performing everybody does not target the common people so some arts uh, some uh, uh, some performers maybe target students some performers are targeting uh, you know a very very handful of uh, you know, limited audience but the performance piece that i showed an image of the where she gets into the garbage thing and inside the, the garbage space in a plastic you know container and so on so that was for the common people and again to go back to the previous question it may not affect or be understood immediately by the common people you are very right it may not even if it is understood they are very skeptical about like the when she gets into that uh, you know polythene bag inside 
that garbage uh, yard and she keeps writing vishwas and faith in that garbage in that plastic bag so the audiences are very curious and what is she doing i mean and why is she doing this so there's somebody in there are interlocutors in between so somebody says she's doing this because of so and so or or when she goes up to this red light area and she keeps writing faith vishwas against human trafficking so human trafficking does not end by doing that but it does bring in a certain message it does as i said again trickle down and it does create a sensation it creates a vibration and when it creates a vibration of course the vibrations will have far reaching effects we hope we hope that and even if it is not understood by the common people they are quizzed by what is going on and they would make an attempt to understand they would try to figure out they would try to comprehend and that is the process and that is the process so the things are in process things have to be in process so when you do not even talk about it so things are not in the process so you have to actually start talking about it to the common people to bring them to talk about it you know thank you so much ma'am for sharing your valuable time with us i on behalf of myself and on behalf of my whole college is my heartfelt gratitude to you thank you so much ma'am thank you so much samya and thanks to your principal as well thank you so much thank you ma'am now let us move towards the first technical session after this session we have some important announcements to make this session will be chaired by mr atunu kumar paul he is the assistant professor and head of the department of english at jms college munger bihar and we have three paper presenters with us first one is dr swagata re second is mr devashish mitra and third is dr partho sarathi mondol i request the admin to kindly put them on screen i and i hand over the session to mr atunu kumar paul hello yes you are audible sir hello okay uh, very very good evening uh, one and all on the other end at the very outset uh, i want to express my heartfelt gratitude to the chairperson of the event uh the principal of the host college purbosthari college dr vivash chandra shah sir for being the mainstay behind such a mega event i feel also honored and privileged to be endowed with such a prestigious duty of chairing a session uh, hence i am thankful to dr shubhamon ghosh uh, the convener of the e conference for uh, such a gracious honor on me uh thanks are due to the entire organizing fraternity behind this uh, cerebral session uh we are listening uh, to professor anita ma'am actually uh, like always uh, uh, it was very much enriching and regaling also regaling to the ear so keeping this uh, train somewhat forward uh, we are moving forward to the paper presentation session first paper presentation session and in this very session uh, we have got amongst us uh, very eminent speakers eminent distinguished personalities uh, from various states different states uh, i i should mention their name at the very outset we have got amongst us dr shagota re associate professor in english gitanjali college of engineering and technology hyderabad india uh, mr devasis mitra has also joined us uh, he is the assistant professor in english government engineering college damon uh, gd and dna in uh, we have also among us the uh presence of dr partha sarathi mondol assistant professor in english and also the head of the institution manbhum mahavidyalay purulia india so uh i would like to without uh, killing much time i would like to uh, move across state 
for the uh, first presenter, Dr. Shagotha Ray, ma'am. Uh, Shagotha Ray, ma'am, she has entitled her paper, uh, Narratives of Domesticity and the Politics of Private Spheres. Uh, ma'am, please start off uh, with your paper. It will be very much uh, graceful on your part. Okay, okay ma'am. Thank you, Arunu, sir. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to the organizers and principals at our Purvastholi College for uh, giving me a space or allow me to share my thoughts. So I am just going to share my screen. Is it visible, sir? Yeah. OK. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. So today, the topic that I have taken up for my paper presentation is narratives of domesticity, politics of private sphere since Shashi Desh Pandey's that long silence. So uh, for this PowerPoint presentation or uh, for this particular presentation, I have divided my uh, uh, presentation into five specific contents. First is the introduction where I would be talking about what is the meaning of uh, domesticity. Second is uh, the feminist interpretation of the space politics, which, uh, which we call as public or private spheres. Then we will move towards the ideology or ideology of domesticity and how this domesticity Shashi Deshpande has taken into consideration in her novel, That Long Silence. And afterwards, it's the conclusion that um, how the feminist, how uh, this uh, domesticity or the politics of private sphere has worked in that long silence. So. Uh, I have taken Tennyson's uh, poem, uh, four line, uh, five lines of Tennyson's The Princess, where it, is, uh, it says, like, man for the field and woman for hearth, man for the sword and for the needle she, man with the head and woman with the heart, man to command and woman to obey, all else confusion. So the above lines or the lines that uh, from the poem The Princess by Tennyson presents the gist of today's argument that is uh, today's argument related to narratives of domesticity. So the concept of separate spheres for man and woman has influenced the modern concepts of domestic cultures that have not been as trenchant as it often presumed. Uh, the division of society into private and public spheres uh, has created a demarcation line on the basis of labor taking biology into account, hence making the spheres gendered. In this demarcated spheres, women have faced double jeopardy. They have been excluded from the public sphere, that is, from the political arena firstly, due to, uh, uh, due to the presumed notion that women lack reason. And secondly, in the private sphere, women become the subject to the natural authority of their male counterparts as male is the authority of reason. So uh, according to Hanish, the idea of uh, the personal is political does not simply mean a relocation or resettlement of the problems from the private individual realm to a public collective realm. But it also means that the domesticated, familiar, emotional, interiorized, and indispensable experiences, specifically the experiences of being a woman, are located in a realm that at the same time upholds operation through gendered equations. Resultantly, the individuated identity of women within this private realm opens up the possibility of an exploration of domestic spheres for uh, political scrutiny, taking domesticity, family, body, and the crisis of space into consideration. So if we take up the uh, meaning, the literal meaning or the dictionary meaning of domesticity, it means it is the quality of the state of being domesticated. Uh, but it 
doesn't or it is not static at all the meaning is not at all static it has multiple meanings and associations that led to the multiple interpretations pertain to politics and personal or both as the personal is political domesticity is generally referred to in terms of paid or unpaid labor the creative endeavors of women within the realm of home and maintaining the domestic sphere generally domesticity draws its meaning from the cultural codes as well as from the traditional and stereotypical performance of women hence a woman is engaged in the routine performance of preparing food washing clothes cleaning the house by eliminating dirt organizing the disorganized things doing laundry decorating home and etc all these works however are considered as proper work due to its nullified contribution in the development of nation uh, so what is the feminist uh, concept related to our feminist stance related to public and private sphere so the concept of space is of central significance when the study of women's subordinate position in the society as well as in the family is considered Uh, Virginia Woolf's advocacy for room of one's own and Elaine Showalter's notion of the problematic of women's space highlight the centerless position of women in the society and family. Even according to Henry Lefebvre, the space is a social product. He also argues that space is the ultimate locus and a medium of struggle. and hence is a crucial political issue as there is a politics of space because space is political such a political view of lefebvre have uh, about space gives an impression that impression of the existence of inequality within the spheres public and the private that is considered as the ultimate part of the space the argument uh, presented by the feminists that a dichotomy between the public and private obliterates the subjugation of women and within the universal as well as in the egalitarian and individualistic order resultantly making the public central within the operative mechanism excluding women as they naturally belong to the private spheres and their contribution will again not be valued women are eternally and unendingly placed in this private realm that is the domestic sphere where they get associated with subjective unmediated and embedded activities of domestic tasks and child rearing thus women and their positioning in the domestic sphere are considered as inferior to the cultured male sphere where men's relationships with the public sphere are transcendental and transformative now uh, the ideology behind this domesticity is that the world that is allotted to women is the domestic world and she has to find fulfillment and happiness of her life in establishing the cordial relationship with the members of this world so uh, a large chunk of women's life goes into the making of the family for which she is least recognized the ideology of domesticity was all pervasive in the victorian period also that led to the discussions on domestic ideologies that further appeared in the literary writings of the period uh, the ideology of domesticity uh, was a feature of middle class life and helped form helped to form a cohesive identity the family represented a secure productive and reproductive unit whilst men accumulated money to support home and family women regulated household consumption in activities ranging from spending surplus income to organizing servants and the ideal domestic women used all her time to make the home run smoothly so in india the history of ideology of domesticity and women's role can be traced from the vedic period uh, both the like uh, in indian scriptures it is also written or uh, to quote manu pita rakshati kumari bhrata rakshati yavane putro rakshati vardhakya na stri swatantram arhati so uh, in english it translates as her father protects her in childhood 
her husband protects in uh, youth and her sons protect her in old age a woman is never fit for independence so both the cult of domesticity and ideology of separate spheres get infused in the society and led to the arousal of critical questions about women's space and existence in the family as well as in the society so uh, the glorified concept of reproduction motherhood sexuality uh, domesticity sexual femininity etc which form the basis of women as mother and wife come under scrutiny feminist critics initiated debates in public forums about the rights for women and for their social upliftment and also to place them more into public domain uh these debates were followed by struggle for the reproduction and abortion rights laws against sexual harassment job segregation on the basis of sex and domestication etc so the symbolic and the sim uh, symbiotic relationship between women and domesticity reveal the fact that domestic power is irreducible to absolute devolution the performativity uh, under quotes butler of domesticity is always presented as the most happy contented and placid form of women's existence that ultimately results in the creation of an inseparable identity of her individual existence so in shashi desh pandey's we find how this domesticity or uh, how she has used this domesticity to present the pre uh, scenario or the situation women are so uh, in the uh, in this particular novel that long silence shashi desh pandey has highlighted the impact of domesticity uh, impact of domesticity taking a tension a tension that is created due to the lack of space and identity the protagonist of the novel is jaya jaya uh, is delivering or delving into her present day scenario so uh, it opens up with a place or the description of a place where jaya is living and is unknown to everyone in that place she introduces herself in the novel as to quote her i was born my father died when i was 15 i got married to mohan i have two children and i did not let a third live she uh, unquote she finds her existence with the existence of mohan jaya defines herself in terms of patriarchal setup and the institution in which she is living shashi desh pandey has used first narrative first person narrative to introduce the protagonist and hence has given a voice to distinguish and differentiate the i within women so shashi desh pandey's jaya is a woman cast in a very traditional mold she represents the indian middle class women of uh, the 1970s whose upbringing is in traditional manner but at the same time is different from the women of the older generations jaya is educated sensible sensitive well behaved and possesses all the requisite virtues of a good woman she believes in serving family and less focuses on her needs and desires even though being aware of it so uh, so resultantly uh, shashi desh pandey in this particular novel has presented two indian women two types of indian women the lower class women who are engaged in menial domestic helps uh, to earn their living for example jija and naina and the middle class women with some financial independence like jaya she again further divides this middle class women into two categories those who never question their marriage and submit to insult injuries and humiliation without any complaint such as mohan's mother kusum vanita mami mukta and there is uh, and there are or there is another uh, strong character like jaya all the major and the minor women characters in this novel adhere to the domestic culture and help in passing on the legacy of this domestic culture to their next generation resultantly these women characters directly or indirectly help the protagonist to realize her status of being 
to quote homeless at home now in a woman's life uh, marriage plays a vital role uh, marriage becomes a career for women and the service to their husbands and to the other members of the family becomes their only destiny jaya is not an exception in this regard she regards mohan as her profession to quote career means of livelihood to unquote now in indian society a woman's happiness is as certain when her husband has a secure job and to quote is cushioned by insurance and provident funds with two healthy well fed children going to good schools unquote on the other hand it is expected of a marriageable girl to be educated and furthermore if she has a university degree she may be more eligible for a husband so jaya's eligibility to talk in english a to quote sign of culture is well recognized by mohan and this is why he gives his approval for the marriage resultantly for mohan to possess that culture and to transcend the nature becomes an added benefit to his male ego mohan is a traditionalist who wishes his wife to be traditionally rooted but at the same time to be somewhat modern he finds in jaya a perfect blend of modern and the traditional so marriage being an institution where the identity of a woman as an individual is suspended marriage in indian society is not to be seen as marriage of two people but as a marriage of two families where the family stands as the ultimate decision making institute so domesticating and disciplining a female body also takes place from the moment when a girl enters into uh, uh, the puberty phase so this puberty phase is also taken as a kind of a, a platform where the patriarchal norms can influence or can be implemented on so through different trainings uh, Uh, uh different trainings the women body becomes the instrument of power politics uh as uh, resultantly the women's body is domesticated and lacks knowledge about authority or ownership over their own body uh, her body needs protection as it cannot exist alone the body of women acts as a site of controlling the private sphere jaya's cousin kusum is well trained in feminine role she flaunts her femaleness by aping the style of grown up women and by to quote swinging her skinny hips from side to side in a grotesque parody of a woman's walk unquote since a girl attains the marriageable age she is always taught to be her husband's counterpart she needs to do whatever her husband wishes and even has to follow what he says irrespective of any adverse consequences she is not allowed to express her desires to prioritize her needs the advice advice that has been given by vanita mami when uh, when jaya was getting married to quote her a husband is like a sheltering tree uh, unquote This line acts as a refrain in the novel as if to convey a louder message to all the existing women in the novel that a woman is a vulnerable one and can remain safe in the shelter of a shelter of her husband. So uh, as uh, this particular norm Hello. of be Yes Hello ma'am I'm sorry for the interruption uh, ma'am could you please be precise in your main yes, thing Yes I, I uh, will take only 2 minutes to uh, okay, okay, up, okay okay ma'am okay this was thank a you. humble uh, reminder okay Oh thank you sir okay. So uh, this particular novel that long silence it contains scenes of domestic violence that also uh, you know gives a kind of a platform that domestication starts uh at the very uh, you know uh, pivotal scene of family so uh it is often as said that man's heart is through his stomach so a woman needs to be a good cook and even after getting a good food she faces domestic violence regarding that so uh in uh to conclude my presentation as time is not how shashi desh pande has used this shashi desh pande presented jaya as an ideal woman 
but this presentation of ideal women shows the politics or the power politics within the private sphere. So Jaya's adherence to the patriarchal norm makes her the woman that the society wants her to be. In acute disgust, uh, depression and disgust, she is in search of herself. That is temporarily she withdraws herself from the role of assigned uh, role assigned to her as a wife and a mother. The protagonist realizes that her trouble is not by others, but it is not outside others, but it is outside her. It is uh, it is inside her. Sorry, those are the worst trouble for any of the women. So Jaya, despite facing allegations from Mohan and even being left alone by him, does not shed the domestic front from within. She, being situated in the Indian familial setup, knows the importance of her existence within the domestic sphere. So there is an innate struggle in the female character. Jaya presents a struggle for space and identity in the private sphere. The desire to be recognized as Jaya, not as through the chain of signifiers. So uh, Shashi Desh Pandey presents a women's struggle for individuality and existence in this particular novel in the domestic domain, keeping her in the respective culture and tradition at the center. So at the end, uh, at the literal level, all the women characters being major or minor in this particular novel show that domesticity is the logico-political sphere of control of the process of individuation. The narrative resoluteness of the chosen text point towards the re-establishment of complete autonomy of women over the purely private sphere. Resultantly, the transgression of the domestic sphere becomes symbolic. It symbolizes as an, uh, as an assertion of autonomous rule and control over one's own body desire, reproduction, and sexuality. Thus, the domestic sphere becomes the site of resistance and also assertion, assertion of one's own space. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for your detailed analysis and a quite good development of thought. Uh, now, I would, like, I would like to call upon uh, Mr. Devashish Mitra, uh, assistant Professor in English, Government Engineering College, Damon. Uh, please share. Yeah. Hello. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Uh, quite audible, sir. Uh, okay. Okay, okay, sir. Uh, then please uh, start off your paper, sir. Okay. Okay. So, uh, thank you, uh, sir. And uh, first of all, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Somo and the entire fraternity that are engaged with making this platform successful. So without further ado, I, my paper entitles Unsex Me Here, Decolonizing Sex and Detexturing Me within bracket female body, uh, queer reading. So throughout my paper, uh, I will be talking about the concept of sex and gender and uh, particularly heterosexuality. And uh, at conclusion, I will try to highlight a very recent problem about the entire concept of being a human. So um, the concept of sex and gender propounded by a high tide of feminist webs, including thinkers everyone knows, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, Kate Millet, Julia Kristeva, Helen Sisu, and so many others, uh, in alignment with the feminist movements, fall prey to an epistemological fallacy for identity while trying to base, uh, trying to reach out the supposedly inclusive nature of female body and female identity uh, at large. But I would like to point out here the very notion of sex as a category is a heteronormative tool uh, or signifier of the consolidation of uh, patriarchal nature nurture binary. Therefore, the heteronormative oppression and repression continued to enslave, better to say colonize the female body. So here the paper aims to peel off the heteronormative layers and textures that are already built into, uh, that are already inscribed uh, or prescribed 
uh, into the female body in so doing it will help to flesh out the identity politics of the normative ideal from a queer lens and which will help uh, us to understand the sex gender sexuality narrative how it becomes normative ideal for people now to understand sexuality is to have an effect of political negotiation between having sex and having a sex having sex means for creative sexuality patriarchy always says it's a duty not the pleasure so it has to be procreative having sex and having a sex that is heterosexuality or cisgender so gender is a social construct everyone knows about it whereas sex has always been considered biological but sex is not biological it is social too uh, i would like to quote an article from a scientist and uh, the name of the article is sex determining region of the human y chromosome encodes a finger protein uh, this is the article written by dr david c page and through this article i will try to find out the problem in the chromosomal sex that is so respectful and loving for patriarchy uh, david c page found out that uh, that which is very different from our conceptualization of the procreative sexuality it is common sensical that x x chromosome makes female and x y chromosome makes male but uh, david page found out that there are some males with x x chromosome and some female with x y chromosome so on the other hand there is another scientist annie foster sterling who also found out that there are some male who lack sperm producing germ cells and some female who lack egg producing cells so if an xx female is incapable of producing eggs and if an xy female uh, sorry if an xy male is incapable of producing sperm then what kind of male and female are we looking at uh, so the point is that they should ultimately be able to procreate to reproduce so it is the reproduction that marks the marking of the sex but uh, but they look female to you they look male to you they have different genitals it is not though as sex comes first gender comes second and sexuality comes later it is the other way around if we look at the first chapter of gender trouble in the first section we will see that butler uses the title the first uh, uh, section of the first chapter that uh, subject of sex gender desire and those words are punctuated with slash with oblique marks so why does he put those oblique marks you know by this specific punctuation uh, obliques we mean that these are synonyms these are alternatives or of the equal value so it is not that uh, sex gender or desire or sexuality are of different nature rather they exist simultaneously at a same time now when we think about sex we think actually about sexuality uh, we actually retroactively construct our sex from our presumptive notions of heterosexuality now needless to say that uh, feminists talked about women rights women empowerment in many branches privilege in several spaces but they did not seem to realize what makes a woman what does woman consist of well it is necessary to quote butler again that uh, woman is a juridical linguistic production woman is created through law and language it is not inclusive enough as a category woman is not inclusive enough there is nothing biological about woman whatsoever so it does not include those subjectivities that do not establish relations uh, in men women defined relational binary now the problem is if woman does not exist excepting relation to men what about those women who do not establish relation to men then they are not quite women so many women of different sexualities come up there is a long list i will uh, mention few like a gender homo romantic woman closeted gender fluid gender queer metrosexual pan romantic polysexual so many uh, you know you know nomenclature the, the terms are always available 
so it's difficult to include it's difficult to uh, uh, encapsulate all of them into the category woman now so we can say that in a way patriarchy always continued to de eroticize sex of difference and placed those non procreative sexualities under eraser so this is how sex, uh, heterosexuality is created uh, if we cannot obey the sex gender desire teleology to become a woman or to become a man uh, then the kind of womanhood that we usually inhabit will not be recognized in patriarchy so therefore it is necessary to debunk the sex gender desire teleology or narrative uh, while dealing with the issue of inclusive female body or inclusive female self so there is a french pun uh, that is encore e n c o r e and another e n c o r p s butler makes use of these two french pun in her book gender trouble encore e n c o r e it means persistence that is still and encore e n c o r p s encore means in the body embodied so both sound the same though they mean differently so here the here the point is so therefore what uh, Wom that woman is identified as the embodiment of patriarchy and female body becomes patriarchal body and on the other hand male body becomes disembodied so men function in patriarchy as common people universal people uh, unmarked by gender women function in patriarchy as marked bodies uh, now i would like to move on from this phase that during the 1980s uh, there was lesbian activism going on because the question of the womanhood was in the air so once there was a lesbian activism which had focused on the radical reformation of sex gender desire narrative now increasingly they centered on securing equality for populations of same sex persons a kind of homosociality you can say homosociality means a one sex that marks uh, the community uh, so which was defined in terms of same sex object choice but gradually movements came up like lesbian feminism lesbian separatism different movements are coming up and radical lesbians too they all of them lost their radical edge from oppositional to coalitional politics they started shifting they were of the opinion initially that we will change the whole gender sex uh, desire system but later on they shifted to separatist narrative specific narrative now those movements initially represented themselves in terms of liberation now what do we mean by liberation is that it presupposes a notion of an innate polymorphous androgynous nature human nature now this politics aimed at freeing individuals from the constraints of sex gender structure that lock them into mutually exclusive homo hetero or feminine masculine roles but this liberationist project uh, becomes invalid uh, for feminist or femi feminist uh, lesbian separatist activists because uh, they favored an ethnic model of identity they favored more communitarian model of identity so these these groups turned their attention to local sites of struggle and focused on securing specific rather than universal transformation of the gender structure so this change that we can see in these strategies has been critiqued as more as a surrender rather than a resistance to the hegemonic gender order so now here i would like to point out one uh, quotation that uh, monic witig famous lesbian critic in her essay the straight mind she says that lesbian is not a woman because uh, it is something which do not establish relation to men so lesbian is not a woman so what morning witig is doing here she is opting out of the heteronormative structure 
and she says that sex is feminine uh, the men being universal so we think saying that being lesbian makes one person instead of a woman uh, here comes again a problem in po as a post structuralist rupture that uh, actually butler talks about that uh, what makes a woman uh, now some of the if uh, a sections in gender trouble butler talks about metaphysics of substance where butler says to quote the subject the self the individuals are just so many false concepts since they transform into substances fictitious unities having at the start only a linguistic reality so what he means to uh, she means to say is that we create substances which something that is as substantial as language it is very self contradictory so can we say that these completely unsubstantial things for words are used to make substance man woman human and so on so here again i would like to uh talk about the notion of object objection which is very much important to highlight this uh term woman or womanhood now objection is something that i have within me but i deny that i have which i have so you know there are some aspects that butler talks about uh, how it is it becomes very easy to understand the notion of objection that uh, shitting uh, uh, defecating uh, urinating are considered as dirt dirt objects so as long as these dirty elements are within our body we do not consider our body as dirt although the body contains the dirt but the moment we have urinated but the moment we have defecated but the moment we have spat so what we have spat out becomes the dirt so it is the dirt that is within me now it is not the dirt that is within me now it becomes the dirt when it is no longer a part of me so here comes a very important question that what is the inner what is what does the body show what is inside unless we bring it out so likewise hello, the hello. gender models hello sir yes, sorry yes, sir. for uh, sorry for the interruption uh, though it is uh, very much uh, enriching and revolutionary also but please sir uh, stick to the time limit uh, please be precise uh, to the chief good or shamam bonam okay okay okay, okay. so uh, likewise gender models that we see or perceive is not expressive of any inner identity gender is always the outside there is no inner core to gender so it is the external that retroactively constructs the internal so now if we look at the in inner nature of female body self or identity then it is better to reorient the concept of humanity itself from feminist lens because the term human is not neutral it is anything but neutral human is a term that indexes access to entitlements rights visibility credibility the notion of human in the long standing enlightenment based humanist philosophy is so racialized so genderized so sexualized that the notion of human needs to be understood from a current feminist lens so now i would like to conclude with some remarks that recent feminist epistemologies queer studies post human disciplines have moved fast in grabbing possibilities while going below beneath and beyond the notion of human so queer post humanism explores recent identification from the dominant forms of human now the long term notion of human often excludes beings that fall outside the white masculine wealthy healthy ableist heterosexual norm so donna haraway in her cyborg manifest to introduce the cyborg as the female body that did not question binary structures or hierarchies uh, so the cyber cyborg space is a kind of space which is used to 
used as a barrier breaking figure in post humanist notion uh, resituating the human non human male female to reconfigure the identity itself now uh, it will help to think surpassing the boundaries to critique humanist anthropocentric fiction of identity and create newer configurations of multiple self selves through newer humanisms disciplines in a post human age thank you so much hello 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 am i audible hello uh, hello mr mr devashish hello hello otto do you hear me ha yeah yeah uh, uh, you are audible sir so this is a nice presentation uh, actually uh, sticking to the time limit uh, we have been bound actually sir to uh, give you a, a limit uh, okay so this was a nice presentation this was a food for thought uh, revolutionary thoughts also uh, were, were coming in and now uh, we have among us uh, dr partho sarathi mandal uh, assistant professor in english and the head of the institution manbhum mahavidyalay purulia uh, his topic uh, for today uh, is finding a voice a study in the folk songs written by anonymous women writers so this was some novel topic novel theme Uh, sir please please sir uh, proceed okay. proceed with okay. your paper sir. okay 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 sir okay atno uh, so thank you very much thank you professor somo ghosh am i audible yes sir yes sir yeah. hello clearly audible sir hello. hello okay okay and visible too i think yes sir okay okay Fine. okay sir please sir so proceed thank proceed for us thank you sir Somo Ghosh, uh, Pubostoli College, and Otono Pal, uh, the chairman. Uh, I mean, who is chairing the session? So he is like my younger brother and very good friend of mine. So it's a very nice uh, occasion today to be here with a an innovative paper that Otono uh, introduced the way. But I don't know how far innovative it would be. But yeah, I thought that uh, that. Uh, Uh, actually i have selected some uh, folk songs uh, from the book women writing in india volume 1 600 bc to the early 20th century edited by sasi tharu and k lalita from oxford university publications so what is the plan of my paper so very simple i have tried to be very simple uh, because uh, in the sense that uh, that uh, i find that these songs uh, folk songs are very simple and as in as it is there in my title finding a voice means here the women anonymous women writers they are giving uh, their own voice a uh, pitching out their own voice so women writers of all ages have a we you know have a natural preference for writing about women characters such preference may be a limitation of their creativity but this limitation does not in any way reduce the importance of women writers uh, i mean there are many such plenty of examples in the present uh, scenario onita desai's cry and peacock fire on the mountain clear light of the day uh, bom gartner's a uh, bombay nantara cycles the time of morning storm in chandigarh the day in sado rich like us are feminist in subject so there are plenty of examples i'm going to that and i will touch upon a very very preliminary uh, idea i mean uh, uh, related to that term feminism that theoretical part then i will move on to the my paper you know that uh, in that uh, famous book uh, Uh, Raymond Selden and Peter Widdison uh, have referred to three phases of women writing. Uh, one is the feminine phase. Other, the second one is feminist phase, 
and third one is a female phase what are these three phases feminine phase in that phase actually uh i mean in that phase according to so walter the female writers of these phase assimilate and express the male aesthetic standard prevalent at that time the patriarchal values of the time are uh, require that female authors can be authors but they should remain gentle women they deal with their immediate domestic social circle and suffer from a guilt complex because they were writers okay so i mean uh i mean during even during a victorian time in europe uh writing women writers were not i mean given any uh, i mean any prestige any place of prestige the feminist phase that at the second phase this includes radical feminist writers who protest against the male values in support of the suffragette community of sisterhoods writers like elizabeth and oliver senior are included here so this is a feminist phase there is a protest then the third one the female phase this includes dorothy richardson catherine mansfield rebecca west all of them develop an idea of specifically feminine female writing as an aspect of self discovery she takes three writers as i mentioned above of these three dorothy richardson is of a peculiar interest to us because first of all her loves long novel series pilgrimage is rather like the novel series of doris lessing and is secondly because at this time joyce and proust were writing about the male consciousness and she wrote about the female consciousness so first one first page a female writer writing a uh, following the ideology style of a male first phase second phase there is a protest and in third phase a uh, writing a female writer writing from he from her standpoint so in my paper i would like to situate my paper in the third phase and with little with a little i mean to some extent interpassed with the second one that there is a protest and there is a voice so they are speaking their uh, i mean own agonies and sufferings and at the same time they are also making a protest so these two i mean phases are there when they are fighting i mean when these anonymous female writers are making or giving uh, i mean giving out their voicing their own concern for their female uh, i mean their their predicament in the society so now and these actually anonymous writers they are translated actually and of the first one there is no title in this folk song okay uh, and that one the first one that i will read out bengali collected by tilottoma dhor from camellia translated by chandrai niyogi so what is there in that first one i'm just reading out the poem for, i mean this song first the ladies are giving the groom a bath they have given him a golden wood seat he is sitting embarrassed like a thief who is harassed by the police monkey sitting embarrassed like a thief who is harassed by the police let's go take a look girls it is it is a treat what a creep he wouldn't touch master well but he uses joba kushum that is uh, joba kushum actually is a i mean a scented uh, kind of well so is a brand name of the uh, scented well of that time when it was written so that's a neat let's go take a look girls it is a treat tamarik on the handloom towels but he wouldn't drive his body with those his thick beard is flowing with the front of soap oh what an incredible feat let's go take a look girls it is a treat he hates river water he does only tap water for him he says even to wash his feet he says let's go take a look girls the groom on the golden wood sit 
so now here in this the groom is given a very special care and the care is given by the girls and at the every moment the girls are cautioned that it is a treat you should do this you should not do that and uh, finally what happens that if we just look into a uh, line after line uh, the ladies are it starts with the ladies are giving the groom a bath so ladies are giving a group so domestic domesticity i mean domestic activity the ladies are they're supposed to give the groom uh, i mean a bath and therefore it it what it happens that the anonymous writer voicing out the condition of the condition of the women of that uh, of the time it was written and actually i search a lot the time frame but what i have come to know it was written during 1920 or 1930 during that time actually so this is the first one and the second one is a very long and uh, it is a odia folk song translated by josna mahapatro and in that uh, particular song you see in the back here in the back here seedlings i sowed and a charming father in law i gained like a back basil in my mother in law fair and slim is my sister in law in my sister in law i found a friend oh but how jealous is my husband how jealous is my husband so why is he out a protest husband is jealous so the jealous is not a happy connotation is not an not a happy term if uh, if actually if uh, anybody's wife who are listening here that says that oh my husband is jealous of this or that i think there will be a riot in the family so so now but how jealous is my husband so this is this is my point that women are giving their voice even in this anonymous song a major of rice he gave me i pounded it and cleaned it but it became so much less i cooked it and served it but it did not fill even a bowl like it how long will i stoop and serve the question a condition of suffering and questioning to the society and for that matter to the family and for that matter to the society so this is their this is what is my point that they are giving i mean that anonymous women uh, writer is uh, giving it, giving a voice voice in the sense for voice in favor of women uh, rights and all these actually these are these songs are to tell you uh, consented upon uh, domestic affairs child caring and all these but even in this microcosm we have the macrocosm we have the yeah, regional to the universal from family to the world so the condition of the family is the condition of the society the journey from microcosm to macrocosm from uh, from a regional to universal and to quote uh, philip sydney's cathexton uh, to cathelu actually philip sydney in his uh, apology for poetry used two terms cathexton that is regional and cathelu that is universal so this is very much there that but it did not feel even a bowl how long will i stoop and serve so he she stoops and she serves she admits it and she voice uh, she actually voices for what his her uh, predicament so now these are uh, i mean there are so many uh, others where uh, i mean i'm i'm going to read out from another one that is uh, the very long one trans it is a telugu and in that song you know uh, we see that kamaksi married into a prosperous family was washing the peas in a pot there arrived then our elder brother she gave him water and stood there silent with tears in her eyes tears in her eyes so if we go details into that song we will see that the actually the brother of that married woman has come to her 
family, I mean, her, her in law's house, and she narrates the sufferings, the condition, though she is married to a rich family. So, in that way, in numerous songs, actually, there are four or five songs. I am not going to go into details because, uh, I mean, so in all these songs, in different ways, domesticity is there, domestic life is narrated, but along with that, their concern, their sufferings, their predicaments, their, their thinking, uh, how, to, how to get an emancipation from this condition, from this male chauvinism is very much prevalent. So this is today, actually, I'm not going into uh, details because I'm the last speaker. I think, uh, I mean, all the participants, I mean, those who are listening uh, already, uh, I mean, uh, so, so this is what I would like to establish in my paper that is in these anonymous uh, female writers, these folk songs, uh, there is a plenty of concern, plenty of strong voices in favor of women emancipation by narrating their sufferings, though it is domestic in nature, though it is very much uh, situated to their family, to their condition, to their day-to-day -day affairs. But we cannot mistake the macrocosm. We cannot mistake the universal. I, I mean, these families, these affairs are the building block of the entire world, entire female world, and for which they wanted an even. That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Special thanks uh, to confirm to the time limit. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, with this paper presentation, uh, we have concluded the three presentations by three eminent persons. Uh, in the first presentation by Dr. Shagota Ray, ma'am, uh, in her paper, narratives of domesticity and the politics of private spheres uh, madam has uh, categorized and defined uh, the paid and unpaid labor uh, she has also stressed importance on uh, problematic of women's space uh, with the uh, theoretical underpinnings uh, of virginia wolf elaine Schalter, henry lefebvre and also uh, taking cue uh, uh, of the ideology of domesticity. Uh, uh, she has uh, reiterated uh, the plight of women, uh, the controlling authority of women uh, being different uh, in different times. I mean, in celibacy, in marital life, uh, after the nuptial knot, and in superannuation. Uh, so power politics within the private sphere, this was uh, MAM's focal point, uh, specifically with the uh, case study of Joya. In that long silence, uh, she has delineated beautifully. Uh, Joya is here symbolic, and her transgression of the domestic sphere has also been symbolic. Joya is not uh, a single Joya. Joya is uh, all the joyage. Uh, so, ma'am, thank you. Space, uh, very good presentation and very good evolution of thought uh, from the theoretical point of view to the specification uh, of Jaya in that particular novel. Uh, then then uh, uh, we have regaled our ears uh, with uh, Devasis Mitra's presentation on Unsex Me Here, Decolonizing Sex and detexturing me uh, by me uh, he has maintained within uh, parenthesis female body a queer reading it was uh, so uh, basically the feminist methodologies uh, which have been applied to identify the female self uh, these things should be read against the grain uh, this uh, this was its uh, main uh, purpose purpose of the presentation. Uh, the concept of sex and gender uh, propounded by a number of feminist scholars like Vivo, Irigare, Kristeva, and all those things, uh, although uh, 
theoreticians uh, actually their coinage their uh, theories uh, sometimes fall prey to intentional fallacy uh, so uh, he has beautifully uh, shown this uh, 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 quite courageous paper it was uh, with her uh, uh, with his uh, delineation of the heteronormative structures of oppression and repression uh, through recurrent gender performance and uh, it has brilliant paper and uh, i hope uh, uh, it has uh, served uh, food for our cerebral thought sure and last but not the least uh, in the paper finding a voice a study in the folk songs written by anonymous women writers uh, by dr parthasarthi mandal uh, uh, the anonymous poets uh, that they share a common ground of feeling and understanding uh, in uh, narrating uh, or in speaking out of the male chauvinism and their uh, investigation uh, into these songs uh, this was actually reiterated by sir it was a brilliant presentation sir and uh, he, ha he has also made attempt Uh, to look, look into the kind of marginalization uh, the women face uh, and they also uh, speak forth uh, uh, through the songs by these anonymous writers so across uh, different lands across different cultures so the voice uh, sometimes becomes similar so uh, this was his focal point thank you sir for uh, Uh, presenting us with a nice presentation now we move on to some uh, question and uh, questions part or deliberations or thoughts uh, by the audience so we should select uh, very few uh, questions or very few deliberation thoughts because uh, we are running short of time already uh, all the presentations are so good uh, uh, okay uh, let me select some questions uh dr sagota ma'am am i audible to you yes atonu sir uh yeah ma'am uh, there is a question uh by brishti mukherji uh Uh, she has oh, sir, kindly, uploaded kindly turn your presentation. On your camera, kindly turn on your camera, please. Okay, okay. Otunu, sir. One minute. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, actually, I have forgotten. Uh, so now, is it visible? I think. okay yes sir uh, so uh, 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 okay uh, ma'am uh, uh, there is a question uh, by brishti mukherji uh, at the very fag end of the question uh, she has also uh, uploaded your presentation that it was a nice presentation thank you ma'am uh, and the question part goes so what is the significance of silence in this novel uh, ma'am the question is to you what is the significance of silence i think uh, she has taken cue from that long silence okay uh, ma'am uh, can you elaborate upon this thank you brishti for this question and uh, i i it is really good that you found this presentation useful for you so as far as the title is considered or as you say, asked that what is the importance of silence or significance of silence there you can uh, you know uh, if you read the novel that long silence if you uh, very keenly observe you will find that jaya never raised her voice against whatever the uh, you know uh, suffering that she was going through she has been abandoned by her husband she uh, was not uh, despite being in love with kamat she was not supposed to uh, share her desire or show her desire of uh, being loved by kamat uh, all these things have uh, you know a piled up but she has never raised her voice so this silence 
can be taken as a form of protest protest which is very loud and the loudness of it is really very much visible when you have taken up that particular word silence into it and you have realized that what uh, is the i mean what is the significance of it so being uh, being silent she has stood up as jaya if you read the novel you will find that on the very first day of her marriage her, she was uh, uh, her name was changed from jaya to suhasini so ultimately with this particular silence she has uh, formed her feet as jaya not as suhasini so silence is a mode of protest you can talk about or you can say that in this long silence so she has or she become the mouthpiece of all the women characters who, um, uh, who are minorly or majorly has uh, you know shaped her thought of being jaya from suhasini she becomes the mouthpiece of them without uttering or showing her disgust or mistrust towards this institution of marriage being into the marriage being into the family she tried to find or she rather found a space for herself which she can call jaya's space and uh, ultimately you will find at the last of uh, or uh, you know last few pages of um, the novel you will find that the way she introduced in the beginning of the novel that uh, i am uh, mohan's wife i am rati and rahul's mother she totally changes that and she brings it but we in a very silent and stealth mode that is the uh, answer i think i hope i have answered your question to an expectation okay, okay ma'am uh, this was not only up to the expectation this was quite good uh, i think uh, everyone is benefited with the answer uh, thank you and oh, thank you ma'am uh, uh now uh to mr devashis are you there right now devashis hello uh, please please unmute yourself hello yeah i saw uh, 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 De devashis sir uh, for you i have chosen one question actually uh, so many questions are pouring in uh Dr Gopal Prasad Sinha sir uh, he has made a question can you kindly enumerate the main relation of the female psychology to the male concept concept of femininity uh, have you have you got yeah. enumeration between female psychology and male concept of femininity yeah enumerating the relation of the female psychology to the male concept of femininity yeah yeah male concept of femininity as we all know that uh, female should be docile submissive uh, cocooned in the kitchen and those things uh, and female psychology is also subject to those patriarchal notions of femininity to some extent but uh, if we uh, look at the recent feminist disciplines then they are really critical of the patriarchal notions of femininity this much i can say so far as i believe thank you hello uh, yes hello uh, th thank you thank you uh, devashish uh now uh, uh uh sir uh, partho sir dr partho sir hello hello uh i think some technical glitches has happened partho sir uh please unmute yourself sir Oh, do you hear uh, me hello 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 yeah yeah hello uh, hello hello we can listen to you sir hello hear me okay okay sir uh, 
ओके सर वन क्वेश्चन आई हैव चूजन ओके जस्ट फॉर अ मोमेंट ओके देर इज शालिनी कपूर रेजिंग द क्वेश्चन इफ द सॉन्ग्स आर रिटिन बाय मेल्स देन द इंफॉर्मेशन कैन बी सेकेंडरी काइंडली क्लैरिफाई आई थिंक दैट विल बी देन इफ द सॉन्ग्स आर रिटिन बाय मेल्स देन द इंफॉर्मेशन कैन बी सेकेंडरी ओके ओके no no they are written by written by female maybe translated by someone else by i mean different translators are there but female songs and uh, actually these are female uh, original is uh, female writers and translated by male and therefore it it, it is included in that book women uh, writing in india okay edited by shashi tharu and k lalita You follow my? Do you, do okay. you, am am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A nice little word. Uh, sir, have you finished with your answer? Hello. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It is yes, actually yes. that um, it, is, it is written in regional language like Bengali, like Telugu, like Odia, but it may be translated by uh, some. I mean, it is also translated by if I'm if I I mean. For example, the first one is kind of, uh, I mean, translated by Nita Ram Ramaya, okay, by translated by Tandrui Niyogi, okay. Uh, yes. So, mm. so they translated by Bhil uh, Nara on Rao. So maybe translated by some male also, but originally it was written by female across the lands. Some one from Telugu, some Gujarati, some Bengali, but they are one at a point to give a voice. This is this. This is what okay. I. Okay, sir. Uh, uh, nicely answered. Uh, I must admit of. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, and uh, thank you uh, also to Devashish Mitra, sir, and thanks are also due to uh, Dr. Shagutare, ma'am. Uh, all the uh, papers were so uh, thought-provoking. Uh, so nicely presented also uh, now uh, we are running short of time so uh, uh, with this uh, note of thanks we must uh, go straight across to our convener sir dr shoma mohan ghosh please sir uh, over to you hello are you there sir yeah yeah i am yeah yeah thank you sir uh, over to you yeah thank you so much mr atanu and thank you all the presenters for such a wonderful discussion now we have reached the end of today's event i sincerely thank all the participants for their patient hearing and participation i know our participants are getting anxious about filling the feedback form i am not taking any names but kindly be respectful to the speakers and be patient when we attend seminars conferences physically we do not do like that the comments i have seen kept pouring in saying asking for the feedback please 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 so i kindly request all of you to please respect the speakers and just be patient anyway tomorrow we meet again at 5 pm india indian standard time the link to attend the event is i think mailed to you already so please be there in time tomorrow we will circulate the feedback form to you in time so kindly stay tuned with us so for the time being a very good evening to one and all thank you so much take care that's all for today thank you